really beautiful. Uh, so Shabbat Shalom. Um, I was asked why I did a repetition. Wendy said, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, not Wendy. Jenny said to me, 10-minute sermon, right? I said, unfortunately, it's one of my slightly longer ones. Why did you do a repetition? It's simple. My kids weren't here yet to do ashray, so I wanted to make sure we got them here. So we will still be done on time, whenever on time is. Whenever we're done, that's on time. So, of course, I want to welcome again Cantor Fried, and it's nice to welcome my parents here as well. Um, as many of you know, I recently returned from a trip to Germany where I had um, really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to perform in a very historic concert. And um, I was asked to share some reflections on the experience I had there and why it was so meaningful, but I thought I'd begin with a little bit of background on Dresden. Dresden is the capital of the state of Saxony. It's the fourth largest city in the area after Berlin, Hamburg, and Cologne, and the 12th largest city in Germany. I didn't know that. Its population in town is just over half a million, and with a very wide metro of about a million and a quarter. It has an incredible history as the seat of the kings of Saxony, and as such, it offers incredible architecture and rich cultural and artistic offerings, rivaling those of the major cities of the world. A fun note is that Dresden is also home to the original Christmas market in the entire world. Founded in 1434, I was there a few years ago for its 583rd anniversary. And because of the volume of high-tech in the area, it's actually known locally as Silicon Saxony which is kind of cute. Dresden's Jewish community has roots back to the 13th century, although Jews were banned from the state of Saxony between 1500 and 1700, so the current community really only goes back a couple of centuries and only in very small part. Before World War II, Dresden had a Jewish population of about 5,000 people, as noted on a plaque outside one of its churches. On the day after the war, there were less than 70. The Allied British and American bombing at the end of the war devastated the city, killing 25,000 people, demolishing entire quarters. And if one were to walk through the historic city center today, much of it, amazingly, would look as it had for centuries. The castle dates back to the 16th century with a palace and main church and other buildings being constructed a couple hundred years later. Today, the palace and its massive vaults hold a museum containing the treasures of Saxony Trust me when I say the likes of which you'd be hard-pressed to find anywhere else in the world. It's simply incredible. The 19th century brought the construction of the first beautiful synagogue just outside the eastern wall of the palace on the riverbank. It was designed by a man named Gottfried Zemper. It was constructed between 1838 and 1840 in a Moorish revival style, as was common in Europe, and a fine example, of course, is the Dohany Synagogue in Budapest. However, Zemper and his synagogue were the first Moorish synagogue built in Europe. You can find photographs of the old synagogue on the Wikipedia page, after Shabbat again. Just after the synagogue was completed, Zemper was commissioned for another important project, the Opera House, which stands on the bank of the river to the west of the palace, inside the wall this time. It still stands there today, and you could spend hours outside looking at the incredible architecture, not to speak of the interior, which is thought to be, by singers, one of the most acoustically perfect opera houses in the world. That house is home to over 270 performances every single year, just in the building. It houses the longest-running orchestra in Europe and one of the finest opera choruses in the world. Sadly, and not surprisingly, the Zemper Synagogue was destroyed in Kristallnacht in November 1938, just 100 years after its cornerstone was laid. The ruins were carried away professionally, and the Jewish community, of course, was forced to foot the bill. A film was made by the Nazis documenting the removal of the synagogue, and all that remains today is the original golden Magen David from the roof of the burning building. It was saved by a firefighter who took it down hid it, and gave it back to the Jewish community in 1949. For half a century, it adorned the top of a small shul used primarily for funerals in the new Jewish cemetery, that is, burials after 1850. 
And today, if you look at the hakol, you'll see a photograph of the doorway of the synagogue. Inside those windows is the golden Magen David. I visited the city for the first time 16 years ago. It was fascinating. 16 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification, and just over six decades since the end of the war, much of the city was still piles of rubble. You could find in the old quarter chain link fence, construction notices, signs that said, attention, stay out, sinkholes, where once a city had thrived. I went back a number of years later. Oh, before I get there, on that trip, they had just finished rebuilding the main church. They used computer-generated imaging to determine from the piles of rubble where the original bricks had been placed in the original structure, and they put them back and filled it in. The frescoes were as they had been 300 years earlier on opening day, the organ playing a magnificent Bach concert that afternoon. The church filled to the brim. It was amazing. I visited uh, four times since, and each time more and more buildings pop up. It's pretty amazing. I went back in 2018 to a hotel across from the palace with a good friend, and I said to him, it's amazing that the building had been here for three, 400 years when the lady at the check-in desk said, no, it's only been here for five years. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, this was rubble. And I looked back in my pictures from a decade earlier, and sure enough, where we were standing was a pile of rubble. But not only have they put back original buildings, including, by the way, gilded Hebrew letters above some of the windows where they had been, they've now built beautiful shopping boulevards, shopping malls, department stores, neon signs, nightclubs. It's the perfect mix of old and new, interspersed, of course, as you would expect, with socialist housing, fondly known by the Germans as Stalinismus. And then there's the synagogue. It makes me think of Tisha B'Av. Echva, echa yashva badad. A plot of land outside the synagogue wall that sat hem empty for over half a century. Toward the end of the 1990s, an international architectural contest was held, people from around the world submitting designs for a new shul. A modernist approach was taken. Two large, imposing, concrete block buildings, about 45 feet tall on opposite ends of a plaza, one housing a sanctuary, the other with a glass wall housing community room, classrooms, and offices for the community. Outside the sanctuary, half of the plaza, a canopy of perfectly cut trees, creating a sort of sukkah as you enter. The other side, a gravel floor with a metal outline indicating the shape and structure of the original building. In the wall, on the back of the plaza, behind the wall, of course, there's a tram stop called synagogue. So in the wall, there are stones from the original plaza, what little remained. It's awe-inspiring to stand there. And then, of course, the Magen David. And this was the first new synagogue built in Eastern Europe, in Communist Europe, since the war. It was completed in 2001. Today, the community numbers approximately 700 Jews who I officially identify as such, maybe a few hundred more who keep their identity private. Most of them are from the former Soviet Union. Very few are from Dresden originally, maybe not even a minion. So before I get to the concert, a little bit of Tisser family history and trivia. In the early 1900s, a man named Laser Stockhammer moved to Dresden with his wife, Leah, and their daughters, Clara and Frida. Some years later, likely after World War I, a young man named Abraham Moshe Tisser moved to Dresden from a small shtetl in the, in the Pale of Settlement, which is now, of course, Ukraine. He married Clara. Together, they had three sons, Leon, Ze'ev, and Max, born in 1922, 24, and 26, Avram was a textile merchant in business with some cousins of his who lived there. They lived in relative comfort in a modest home on a quiet tree-lined street just off the main park, maybe a few hundred meters from the city center. In the 1930s, they understood that things were becoming challenging for Jews around Europe, and they sent their eldest two to Frankfurt for a program called Hachshara. Hachshara prepared young men from Europe to make Aliyah to Palestine and to work in agriculture. It gave them a background in Hebrew 
a background in English, and a background in agriculture. So they made Aliyah to Palestine and they went to agricultural school. But shortly after they went to Frankfurt, their mother took ill and passed away, Clara. She's buried in Dresden till today. Then the Nazis came. And just a few weeks before Kristallnacht and a couple of days after the boys left for Palestine, there was an action to send all Jews from Germany with Polish papers back over the border. Avraham and his youngest son were taken to the border with all the Jews of Dresden, and they were left in Spatzin, Poland. They were heard from about six months later in Krakow and never again. Our imagination can tell us the rest of the story. Leon went on to serve in the British Army and then in the newly formed IDF. He eventually worked for El Al. His son, His son is my father. He was killed 67 years ago this month. When my father was five months old, his plane was taken out of the sky by communists during the Cold War, an El Al plane, on Erev Tisha B'Av. His brother Ze'ev lived in a moshav in the north of Israel until 2010 when he died with a beautiful family. So now the interesting question, how did I end up in Dresden a century after my grandfather was born, 85 years after the Jews were expelled from the city? Well, life has its ways of creating interesting opportunities. In 2019, Robin and I were in Dresden and on that trip, I decided for the first time to reach out to the Jewish community, and I said, hey, I understand you don't have a rabbi or a cantor. I'm in town, and I'm going to come to shul, and I'd be happy to daven for you. They said, sure. So we went to shul, and on Saturday morning, there were about 12 people in shul, half of whom weren't Jewish, just liked coming to shul. So I davened, and then I found out I was to read Torah, because they had no one who could read Torah. I saw an organ on the pulpit, and I said, who's playing that? They said, well, currently no one. I said, so why do you have an organ? They said, well, some rabbis like it, some rabbis don't. We met a man named Michael. He was an American. He was an expat from Seattle. He conducts a chamber orchestra dedicated to Jewish liturgical works and the works of persecuted Jewish composers of Europe. We, stuck, we struck up a friendship, and we remained in touch every couple of months exchanging emails. He called me later that year to let me know that he had become president of the Jewish community. I told him that's the second best position. Past president is, <laughs> he's still president. He asked me if I'd like to come back to Dresden. I said, sure, what do you have in mind? He said, well, we'd like you to come back in April of 2020 to perform a concert with the opera chorus. I said, well, <laughs> sure. Of course, I agreed. It turned out that the federal government of Germany had put aside hundreds of thousands of dollars for programming works of art, memorials, commemorating 1,700 years since the first record of Jews in German-speaking lands. We would sing a program of synagogue music that had been traditionally sung in that part of Germany during the height of its community about 100 years ago. The opera chorus had never sung Hebrew. The opera chorus in 400 years had never visited the Jewish community or the synagogue. They described this as an exotic experience. I never thought exotic and Lewandowski went in the same <laughs> sentence. Robin and I were very much looking forward to this trip. It was to be sort of a honeymoon a couple of months after our wedding. And then the world had other plans. We got married and the world made us permanent roommates for a couple of years. <laughs> Three weeks later. The concert had been rescheduled four times, and it had to be done this month, or the funding from the government would run out. Thankfully, the pandemic numbers stayed low. Travel was challenging, but possible. I clocked 47 hours round trip to Germany, and the show went on. So there I stood on the bima of this modern concrete block synagogue 
about 20 meters away from where my grandfather would have become a bar mitzvah in 1935. I was emotional to say the least. It was hard to sing the first couple of numbers between the family connection and simply the fact that I hadn't done that in three years. I was nervous. I was really nervous. I clung to my notebook. But after a few pieces, I could pay attention to the majestic organ, this choir of 40. And I looked at the faces of a few members of the Jewish community who sat in the first couple of rows. They were the Dresdeners. They had been there. I watched what happened in their eyes as they heard music that they hadn't heard since childhood. And all of a sudden, I got some strength. I realized that this music hadn't filled the airspace of this plaza in almost 100 years. So we recreated history and bring, brought it back to life. We sang familiar tunes by Novakovsky and Lewandowski, Naumburg, Zulzer, and a tribute to contemporary German-born composers, a kiddish by Kurt Weil. It was just glorious. And all that after more than two years of not having performed. Kosire Vaya, my cup overflowed. The vast majority of the audience wasn't Jewish. They were curious, attracted not by the venue or the music, but by the appearance of the opera chorus. There is a very strong choral tradition in Germany. All the singers of the opera chorus and of the opera are government employees in Germany. The applause at the end of the show went on for 13 minutes. Two encores and six bows later, I was famished. There was a man in a black hat. I thought he was a Chabad rabbi. Then I found out, no, the Chabad rabbi would never set foot in this shul. It was the general manager of the opera. He invited us to dinner. We sat down, poured a beer, of course, and we all felt wonderful about that night. We agreed that something historic, something important, something really necessary had just happened. It's hard to put into words exactly what it felt like, but it is my intention to return to that place again, to that sacred place, to keep alive my family's connection to that city and to keep alive the traditions that filled that hall. I will visit our family's graves. I will visit the fledgling community struggling to rebuild after the Shoah and further after communism. Perhaps one day you'll join me. We can go as a community. It means so much to them to know that there are Jews across the ocean who care about their well-being, about their very survival as a community. They ask me to express to all of you their gratitude for affording me the opportunity to visit and to share music with them. In their words, it was a gift. And I share that sentiment to serve a congregation that supports its clergy in these and other important ventures is a gift. I'm grateful to all of you. In a couple of weeks, on July 14th, I will be screening a video of the concert across the hall. Unfortunately, we can't post it online because as government employees, the union workers have the singers. We can't put it online. But I hope you'll join on July 14th. It was an incredible night. I close with a prayer that the community in Dresden, the communities throughout Europe, and our community here, continue to go from strength to strength, celebrating our history and working hard for our future. May God bless all that we do. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.